order the regular city council meeting of July 20th, 2023 to order. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Kissler. Here. Gage. Here. Bradbury. Here. Matani. Here. Flora. Here. Gas. Here. Finnegan. Here. Thank you. Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> the Ketchikan City Council would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional first people of this land in Ketchikan, Tongass Plankett people. Tonight we have four public hearings. The first one is a public hearing on Ordinance Number 23-1973. Amending Ketchikan Municipal Code entitled Imposition of Passenger Warfage Fees to increase those fees, adding a new section entitled Advanced Payment of Passenger Warfage Fees. Is there anybody here who would like to speak to that tonight? Seeing none, we're going to close that public hearing and move on to public hearing on Ordinance Number 231974, amending the Ketchikan Municipal Code entitled Limits and Prohibitions of marijuana establishments. Is there anybody who'd like to speak to that? Seeing none, we'll close that public hearing. We have a public hearing, public hearing on resolution number 23, 2885, amending to the 2023 general government operating and capital budget to provide for supplemental appropriations for the police department in the amount of $5,500. Would anybody like to speak to that? Seeing none, we'll close that public hearing. And lastly, public hearing on resolution number 232887, amending to the 2023 general government operating and capital budget to provide for supplemental appropriations for risk management in the amount of $96,000. Would anybody like to speak to that? Okay, that was easy. So that will end our public hearings. As far as communications, we have uh, some weight on the tables in regards information on warfage fees, several committee reports, um, and one document from the borough planning department. Okay, that's going to bring us to persons to be heard. I believe we have five people signed up tonight. We're not going to impose the three minute time limit, um, but please, um, by all means, you know, make your case and try to be succinct. And uh, then we'll have at it. So, Madam Clerk, who's our first? Our first speaker is Eric Matson. Thank you. I'll try not to take too much time. <laughs> um, Eric Matson, I'm the deputy police chief. Found my notes here tonight. I'm here to introduce two of our newest police officers with the Ketchikan Police Department. But before I start that, I want to tell you how we got here today. Um, for each officer, they take or start with the comprehensive written and physical exams. Uh, after that, they submit a lengthy application and then are either invited to an oral interview board or not. After the oral interview board, if they're successful with that, we take in submit them to a background investigation. That's assigned to one of the detectives and that usually takes weeks. Uh, the detectives probe into their lives. They talk about or talk to landlords, neighbors, friends, friends of friends. So really they try to run down every rabbit hole and learn everything they can about each candidate. Only after all of that, do they get a conditional job offer. A conditional job offer is required to do a medical screen by a doctor, a psychological exam, and a polygraph or a truth verification that goes back over everything. It goes back over all the answers that the detectives got. Um, so once they pass that, they're required to attend and successfully complete the State Police Academy in Sitka, Alaska. They attended the Alaska Law Enforcement Training or ALET 2301. This is a four month live in academy. They have daily physical training, study scenarios, driving, firearms, study the law, rules, court testimony, use of force. They get pepper sprayed, they get tasered, they fight, they do defensive tactics, they do handcuffing, and in all that, they're reviewed and graded on the relationships with the staff, their peers, their attitude, 
their professionalism, appearance, and above all, the practical application of all learned topics. They graduated from the academy and are ranked based on performance and academics. These two officers behind me graduated in the number three and four spots among all the other recruits and classmates. These classmates consisted of recruits from the Alaska State Troopers, Juneau Police Department, Kodiak Police Department, University of Alaska Fairbanks Police Department, and Valdez Police Department. After all of this, they now are attending another three and a half month training with their field training officers. So officers that we have in the police department that evaluate them daily on police work, their contacts with people um, and in the community. Both are at different phases in that. I'd also like to note that both these uh, officers behind me are US Army veterans and one is currently serving in the US Army National Guard. So it is my pleasure to introduce our two officers, Nick Noland and Sam Jenkins, but more commonly they're known among their peers as badge 228 and 233. Uh, I'm Officer Nolan. Uh, I moved up here from Brookings, Oregon. Uh, started in uh, December of 2022. Um, moved up here for my daughter. I look forward for the, to the opportunity to serve the people of Ketchikan and work with the Ketchikan Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Officer Jenkins. Um, I moved here about two and a half years ago, end of 2020. Um, I, had, I had family here. I wanted to move up here to spend time with my family. That's really a big value of mine um, is to build relationships with others, um, which is a big reason why I wanted to become a police officer is to have that sort of community, a relationship with everyone. Um, I am really looking forward to growing you know, with all of you guys. You know, it's a big honor to have to work, to get to work with this city. I'm really excited to see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Who's next? Deborah Simon. Yeah, I can't make this one. Yes. Deborah Simon speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of the Library Advisory Board. Tonight, the City Council will be discussing the Ketchikan Library's collection development policy. I hope each of you has better luck with that subject than I have had. Since the beginning of this year, I have been trying to ask clarifying questions about this policy that has never been reviewed by the Library Advisory Board. I asked before the April meeting and was put off. I asked during the April meeting and was put off. I asked after the April meeting and was put off. In fact, at that time, our librarian told me that because the policy was a future agenda item, I would not have any answers until it was reviewed during the July meeting. And so I asked during last week's July meeting. And here's some of what you'll hear happen when you listen to that recording. One board member made a motion to limit the discussion time to three minutes each before it had even begun. Another board member tried to limit the total discussion time. Four board members stressed that they pointedly did not agree with the city council's decision regarding the book, let's talk about it. And besides, it was only one of thousands of books and so its disposition didn't warrant any changes to a policy that had worked so well for so long. I was able to ask some questions, during which Mayor Kiefer made faces to other people in the crowd as I spoke. Those questions weren't allowed for long though, as board member after board member asked for conclusions instead of questions, despite the fact that the chairman said at the outset that the board would quote, do some general discussion and then see if we want to make any motions, unquote, which is the definition of review. And I was berated by you, Mr. Finnegan, for just this issue. 
Because as you said, quote, I reviewed it, I reread it, I didn't find any problems with it, I don't have any problems to propose with it, that was reviewing it in preparation of this meeting, I would love to just, if, um, I, and so that's why I'm asking if there are any changes to propose to it, I would love to discuss it specifically, otherwise I would love for us to move on, unquote. And move on, the board did. The issue will be moved once again to October's agenda. However, this time, no further questions or comments from board members will be allowed. Only suggested changes to be submitted in writing no later than one month prior to the meeting because, in the words of another board member, quote, I don't want to look at it again unless there's actual motions. With the small amount of information I was able to gather, one thing is clear. Our library is driven by the philosophy and policies of the American Library Association. There is no mention of the Ketchikan Library's mission statement, goals, or values driving the collection development policy. There is only the ALA. So I ask you, whose library is this? Ketchikan's or the ALA's? And I asked uh, that a letter be handed out. I will read that to you. In my capacity as an appointed library advisory board member, I was subjected to inappropriate behavior and comments from Mayor Kuyper and its members of the library advisory board during the July 12th meeting. A higher standard is expected of public servants. I respectfully request that the city council address this issue and that it not happen again. Thank you. Any questions for yourself? No questions. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, is my understanding that uh, it calls for the library advisory board to review the collections policy annually? Is that correct? That is what the beginning of it says. That it is reviewed. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, it is. One of you have it in front of you. Yeah. The first one. You have one. It's reviewed by both the librarian and the library advisory board. Thank you very much. So. So I guess my, my broader question beyond that would be, is there any specific reason given as to why you weren't allowed to review? Because to me, reviewing is discussing, ex uh, exchanging ideas as a group, considering possibly making changes. Was there any real reason given why that was cut off? The best I can tell you is that the rest of the members, at least those who spoke up, said that they had reviewed it and they had no issues with it. Multiple questions and comments that I had were met with very vague answers. And I can tell you only from my point of view, it felt like nobody wanted to either put in the time and or didn't want me to ask questions. Any other questions? Thank you. Tanya Hedlin. Okay. Um, my name is Tanya Hedlin. I am here to ask the city council to enforce a thorough review of the library collection development policies. There are people in this community that do not agree with how this library gets its materials and what materials they have. Please hear the opposing views and work with them. I also hope that the council members will take this opportunity to start going outside their social circles to see what people think of the library and how it's ran. Go to the shipyards, go to the docks, go to the mechanics, stores, fisheries, grocery stores, etc. You will see this town is very divided and not so one-sided. The city council hears from a library advisory board that seriously lacks diversity and in fact the board only has one person with opposing views, and I watched as the board members tried and was eventually successful in silencing her when she tried to review the policy and it was all done in a very belittling way. It was hard to watch. That members, that members approach is a much needed, sorry, that members approach is a much needed approach at how this policy needs to be looked over and scrutinized. You can't review a policy by simply stating you read it and you think it's fine. And the other elephant in the room that I would also like to address is the mayor's conduct. Uh, 
The mayor said that we should address the council when speaking at meetings, yet I have been lectured by both council members and public while he sat and allowed it. And the same thing has happened to me at the library advisory, at library advisory board meetings. As a former federal employee with 15 years service, I was held to a higher standard than most others. The same is expected of the mayor. I have watched him make basis talks among those near him while the public is speaking and heard offensive comments made. That is not how a mayor should conduct himself. And I would hope after tonight that behavior will change. That's all I have. Any questions from Ms. Hampton? Thank you. Janelle Gage. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'll go Anyway, we will, we are recording it and we will. Janelle Engage, 2512 Third Avenue. I'm speaking for myself and not that of the council. Sixth generation catch connect. Everything that happened to Jews of Europe during the horrors of the Nazi reign, to African Americans during the lynching terrors of Jim Crow, and to Native Americans as their land was plundered and their people murdered, happened because a large enough majority have been persuaded and open to being influenced by individuals who spouted misinformation regarding fellow human beings. A message that told them that God ordained these fellow human beings as beneath them, subhuman, and deserving of their fate. What would we have done if we'd been in their place? And how many would have gone up against such a tide of belief? Or would be able to see the evil as it was occurring? Today in our community, we're seeing the same rhetoric, just as dangerous. Community members spewing hateful falsehoods regarding employees and those of minority groups who dare to stand up to them, speak openly about their experiences and demand equality. These individuals continue to gaslight those of us speaking up as divisive, divisive because we refuse to sit down when we're told and continue to stand up against censorship racism, anti-LGBTQAI+, and dare to call people out when they spew unfounded rhetoric to dehumanize our neighbors and fellow community members. The public library is for everyone. The idea that it is a hostile environment because there is a book on a shelf that one individual doesn't approve of or an event at the library that they disagree with is not a viable argument. Attacking librarians and others who disagree with this group's ideology has been the go-to for the last couple years. Calling an entire group of people pedophiles, child groomers, and accusing community members of indoctrinating children and young adults is wrong. And there is no proof of any of it. I hear several people say, keep that blank in the lower 48. Yet where, where are they from? And what did they bring here from the lower 48? Because as a sixth generational Ketchikan Knight, I would know a thing or two about what was been here. I grew up in that library and no one ever interfered with my ability to wander the bookshelves. Yet today we have adults who want to impose their ideal reading list upon the entire community. They are vilifying our librarians and anyone who doesn't join them in the idea that they must protect the children by censoring our community and what they read. The last time books were contested at the Ketchikan Public Library was in 1908, 1984, and 2009. What books are next on their chopping block? Every book that speaks openly regarding rape, incest, LGBTQA+, and hate? Books are under profound attack in the United States. They're disappearing from library shelves, being challenged in droves. Books by our authors of color, by LGBTQ plus authors, by women. Books about racism, sexuality, sexual assault, gender and history, among others. Now people in this community want this council to, 
to do the same and begin the mass censorship of our public libraries. It is not the council's job to micromanage departments. I was told this by several people. It is not the council's job and nor are we the expert in this field. The city council has more significant issues and staff who are well equipped to do their jobs. Last time I checked, we as a council took an oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States and that of the state of Alaska, not the Bible. And again, there is a reason for separation of church and state. And one's religion places rules upon that person who follows that, re that religion, not those of us who don't. We have no business doing the work and going through this policy for the librarians. They should be doing their own work. And that includes the advisory board. And I also sat in that meeting. And everyone got to speak. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Gage? Thank you. Thanks. Squeeze. We have one uh, Kathleen Pearson. Sorry, it's shorter. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Kathleen Pearson. I am here to speak entirely on behalf of myself, um, and I am here to discuss kind of just the importance of the library. I know there's been a couple issues in the past, um, but I'd like to kind of discuss it overall and its importance and why we shouldn't limit certain books. Um, so books can do amazing things. This book, for example, talks about Piggy and Gerald who realize they're in a book and can actually make me say the word banana out loud. Um, and there's just some amazing powers to books. Um, you know, books can be an escape, and so can the library. This book, for example, talks about a kid named Stevie, who the library is a place of quiet relief for his six siblings. Books can teach you about how difficult school can, can be for someone who is different, um, about the love we think we deserve, that you are not alone even when the rest of the world wants you to believe that you are, um, there are even books that teach you about the importance of teaching. Uh, and there are books that also teach you about your rights, that you have certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'm not sure about everybody else, but books contribute to my happiness. Um, there's even, we could talk about the freedom of speech in the Constitution. Would you say that allowing these books for public use would be considered freedom of speech? Now, to my understanding, the community is worried about potentially corrupting our youth, and I know we aren't going to just outright and say it, but let's just call it what it is, censorship. But we aren't trying to prevent our kids from reading Jane Austen, Shakespeare, or F. Scott Fitzgerald because they consist of important parts of our historical literature, even though they discuss sex before marriage, manslaughter, drugs, drinking, suicide, and more. Um, and what about the Bible? Uh, that discusses a whole other genre that I have a certain amount of time, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but there's a lot of discussion about different just things that happen in the Bible. Oh. And I know certain members of our community are worried about our kids getting ideas from these books. For example, the Let's Talk About a book, which I would have brought here today. However, it was checked out at the library when I went to go pick it up. Uh, so I actually ended up looking it up on Amazon and they give you that little sample. And the first three pages, it talks about the importance of consent, which, especially in this day and age, is something extremely important we need to be talking about to our kids. Sorry. Um, apologize, I dropped this book. Uh, however, I like to think the library is like the room of requirement. It's really hard to find what you need if you don't know what you're looking for. These books aren't putting ideas in our kids' head. These books are providing a safe way for them to find the knowledge they want to know about. Human beings are curious by nature. They aren't gonna stop looking for these answers just because there isn't a book about it. 
but I will leave you with this slight thought. Uh, there was somebody once in World War II who tried to do something very similar. <clears throat> not well, I apologize, not very similar. It was on massive scale, but something similar. Didn't work out that well for him. And I just want to point out here, too, that all of these books are all books that can be found in different sections of the public library. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Pierce? Thank you. That's the end of our list, Your Honor. That's everybody who signed up to speak to the council this evening. Is there anybody else who would like to address the council? Your Honor. I'd like to. Mr. Guess. Uh, Brother Guest, 1200 Woodside Drive, speaking on behalf of myself, not the city council or anybody else. Uh, I don't have anything written. I won't take too much time, but I just want to take the chance to, I think this is a good time to say that I feel that it is high time for the community to compromise and come together. It's apparent that on this issue with programming and things in the library, a huge percentage of the community feels that the other side is vindictive, spiteful, hates them, doesn't welcome them, etc. And the other side feels the exact same way. Um, my personal opinion was the decision made on let's talk about it was a step toward compromise because we did not ban the book. We did not throw the book out. Simply, it was to remove it from the children's section so the unsuspecting uh, young kids don't stumble upon it. I think with the motion or the um, topic of it, repealing the borough funding last year that was a cry out from the community that said please consider all of the community a uh, half of the community does not want their tax dollars going to sponsoring drag shows and these other things and i do feel that there hasn't been a whole lot of compromise done so i just think if both sides can realize that their neighbors are not evil they don't hate them they have a fundamental disagreement they're not terrible people, and we can come together with compromise that says, okay, maybe the people on the far side of one side of the issue aren't totally happy with what's going on there, but the other side can say the same and we meet in the middle. So I just would like to call for some unity and for all people, including myself, council members, staff, members of the public, to maybe just consider that. And instead of trying to push full throttle with their beliefs or my beliefs or whatnot, we just consider the whole community and try and find somewhere in the middle. So that's what I have. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Gauss? Okay, thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to the council this evening? Okay, seeing none, then we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, I believe Mr. Finnegan had one. Yeah, I'd like to pull the minutes from the regular council meeting of July 6th for one word be changed, if I may, please. Okay. Any other proposed changes? Okay, well, we need a motion. Move to consent. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. So we're gonna remove the approval of minutes from the consent agenda. We'll consider that separately. Um, is there any other discussion on the consent agenda? If not, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Resolution number 232885, amending the 2023 General Government Operating and Capital Annual Budget to provide for supplemental appropriation for the police department in the amount of $5,500. Approve the procurement of Baylor relining parts in the amount of $60,000 with Pioneer Supply, Inc. Resolution 232887, amending the 2023 General Government Operating and Capital Annual Budget to provide Supplemental appropriations for risk risk management in the amount of ninety six thousand and authorize certain transfers. Procurement of SCADA maintenance support services, Open Systems International Inc. A budget transfer, KPU Telecommunications Division Overtime. Change order number two to contract number twenty two zero eight, replacement vehicle for public works building maintenance, Bowen Scarf Ford. Any comments? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Gas. Yes. Finnegan. Yes. Gage. Yes. Kissler. Yes. Bradbury. Yes. Matani. Yes. Flora. Yes. Okay, let's consider item 5A right now. 
House yeah. Member Finnegan. Uh, if I may, I'd request a change to page 10, paragraph 7 of the minutes. Uh, the word supplementing should be replaced with the word supplanting in my comments about the uh, discussion surrounding the library. Do we have a second? second. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody wish to discuss it? Okay, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll on that? Matani? Yes. Bradbury? Yes. Kistler? Yes. Gage? Yes. Finnegan? Yes. Gas? Yes. Flora? Yes. Motion passes. That's going to move us on to unfinished business. Item 6A, ordinance number 23-1973, amending Ketchikan Municipal Code, section 13-10030, entitled, Imposition of passenger wharfage fees to increase those fees, adding a new section 1310055 entitled Advanced Payment of Passenger Wharfage Fees, Second Reading. Chair will entertain a motion. Your Honor. Yes. I move the City Council approve ordinance number 23 1974 in second reading, amending the section 13.10030 of the Ketchikan Municipal Code entitled imposition of passenger warpage fees to increase those adding section 13.10.055 entitled advanced payment of passenger warpage fees and establishing an effective date second it's been moved in second discussion council member your honor i would move to uh postpone this until the august 3rd meeting second it's been moved and seconded the only reason that I was wanting to postpone it to the August 3rd meeting is we do have a special meeting next Wednesday, the 26th, to talk about birth refinancing options. And I would like to hear that prior to um, deciding the rates for the next two years. Discussions on the amendment. Mr. Gass. A uh, question for the acting manager. From your angle, is that going to... Do you have any input on that? Is that going to affect anything? Or? Your Honor, um, I'm happy to address Councilmember Gass's questions. I believe the manager is online. Um, oh. If you would rather direct that to her, but I'm, I'm here. That's fine. Okay. Sure. Uh, Councilmember Gass. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> this is why my camera's not on. I look worse. Oh. <laughs> um, that will not affect it because the implementation of the fee is for 2024 and postponement will not impact implementation. Thank you. I have a, other comments. Yeah. Go ahead. I wasn't sure why we were adding the amendment. So if somebody has the recommended amendment. That would be. You're talking about the, the increase in fees? The, the, and then she read only the first. Yeah. I don't and not the recommended amendment, which I think oh, the attorney okay. recommended. I don't, the manager could answer that, right? Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, Council Member. The amendment was only, it's not necessary, but it was to clarify that there are changes happening in 2024 and 2025. It was something that Mitch recommended just to be super clear that there's going to be a fee change in each year. Okay, does that, so, does that answer your, your question? So I would like to change my motion to add the recommended amendment. Point of order. There's a motion to postpone on the table. Yeah. yeah, we have to we have to discuss okay. that first. Okay. Other discussion on the motion to postpone. So I have a question. Then define the value of the po postponement in re relative to whatever happens with birth three. Um, we know that there's going to be changes in port fees. We know I have several examples I can discuss if we need to the condition of the port fund. So what's the value to the community for putting this off? 
Uh, let's see. I'm gonna tread this lightly. Um, sorry, I'm trying to make sure that I follow executive session rules on on my statements here. Um, for me, I and I said this last uh, two weeks ago that I wanted to see something a little bit more long term. Three years is what I would have liked to see. Um, I am wondering with the birth three financing options is whatever those financing options are. Are we going to need to extend out an increase into 2026? to take care of that financing option because if we if they say hey guys we need we need four years of support increases to cover this birth three financing i want to i just didn't want us to have to come back right after that meeting to add two more years on to you know the increase because we do need those increases so the reason i was wanting to postpone it till after is to ensure is the two-year increase at what we have right now adequate or are we needing to do do we need to put on paper right now three or four years to ensure that the, whatever financing option is could potentially be secured for for that so that was the only reason i was wanting to just do it right after that meeting to make sure we didn't need to add any any more years on it versus wasting our time to do it to do two more hearings um after that that's the only reason yeah Ms. Gage. It's my understanding that the idea was to do this for now, and then in, once we get the report back from management, that we would then look at um, what we need to bring it up to. I'm not going to uh, support uh, postponing this anymore. Okay. Other comments before I make a, a comment? Mr. Gass. Just to, listening to both sides here, I think you both have valid points. For me personally, I I th I'm leaning more towards just passing this now and then figuring out what we need to do for futures later. Cause I, I do see your point that it, it would be extra paperwork and stuff, but um, I don't think it would be a big problem if, if we get the information back and have to do something for future years. I think that would just be another step on the path. So with respect, I think I'm in favor of just going ahead and passing this tonight. Okay. Well, I'm not going to support the delay either. I'm not going to elaborate why I think it's been spoken to. I have some specific points, but I don't think they're particularly relevant. So is there any other comment on the motion to delay? Ever? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Gage. Yeah. No, excuse me. Did I have the wrong word? Bradbury? Yes. Kissler? No. Flora? No. Finnegan? No. Gas? No. Matan? Yes. Okay. That amendment fails. That brings us back to the council I'll let you finish. Brings us back to the main motion. Go ahead. Your Honor, I would like to amend the ordinance to state that $2 per passenger be designated to capital improvement fund. That seems to die for lack of a second. I'll second it for a discussion. Okay, it's been moved and now it's been seconded. So let's discuss this. The reason I wanted to kind of designate um, a certain amount of funding to actual infrastructure improvements is, as I have learned, that there is a hierarchy of how funds are dispersed, operations being number one, then capital and uh, debt services and whatnot, as we learned through COVID, what that shelf is. Um, and so with, I'm, I'm just designating the $2 increase to go towards capital improvement so that we can start saving up money for these big projects versus um, right now it all goes into one place and usually goes operation based. Um, we have a dock that is not in great shape as hopefully we'll find out with a, a new inspection of uh, cathodic protection. But I just 
I felt comfortable with that increase just designating some funds. Obviously, I do want to point out, I did just strictly say $2 so that, for instance, in 2024, nine would stay to whatever we want. $2 would go to the capital improvement fund or part of it. Um, and then in 2025, 11 would go to whatever and just the extra $2 would go to the, the capital improvement. So as we increase um, whatever those increases are, um, the regular operations and whatnot would still be increasing their revenue each year based on the increase, um, but we would still have like a little piggy bank for our big project of our dock not falling in the water. Council Member Gass. I have a question, and it's probably a stupid question, but with cathodic protections, does that fall under the CIP? Yes. Council Member Whistler. Uh, I think it's kind of a given that it's going to go to the CIP, the infrastructure. I, I don't see a reason to just say $2 of it goes to the CIP, because I think more than that will go, and I'm I don't, I don't see a reason to separate it out and make it confusing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Matali. I think I agree with the $2 going to capital funding because I know council member Chester says that more will go, but at least here we have a safety net and we need that safety net. So I will be supporting this because we need to build up this fund because this is not the only issue that the ports have. There are other issues. Even the harbors have issues that will come up. So we need to start building up a Katie. Okay, I'm going to weigh in on this. I'm not going to support this. I don't know the basis of the $2. At this point, if you look at the health of the port fund, I think it's pretty common knowledge that there is no rate structure that's going to serve the needs of the capital improvement that we need to do. These proposed increases in the fees without the, the $2 dedicated towards any portion of it will help defray it. But we're not going to do the cathodic protection. There's no rate structure that's going to solve this for us. There's going to be other discussions in the future, I would imagine, to speak specifically to how we fund those bigger projects like the cathodic protection, which is now an unknown variable. I'm going to pause here because I'm getting dagger eyes and I think, no, 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 do you guys, excuse me, would staff like to weigh in here? Please do. There, there, Your Honor, there's just two points that the finance director and I wanted to make relative to this discussion, just to clarify. Firstly, we have a public enterprise fund and this supports both the operations and the capital improvement of the board. So there is no separate um, fund or kitty when it comes to capital improvement. It all goes into one fund. And as Councilmember Bradbury just mentioned, we do have sort of a hierarchy in how we use those funds relative to the port. Also, as Councilmember Matani just mentioned, we do have um, infrastructure needs at the harbors. The way that the harbors and the port um, are supported, there is some sharing of assets, but we do not use port funds to support capital improvement at the harbors. That's an entirely separate fund. So I just wanted to, to clarify those things when we talk about setting aside specific uh, revenue increases for capital improvement at the port. Okay, thank you. So that, that being said, um, I'm not going to be in support. Delilah has oh. to hand this to Yes, um, please, Ms. Walsh. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I just want to point out, if this does pass, that we do designate in 13.10.140 the use of fees. And if it does pass by Council, I would recommend that motion also include that staff go back and revise it rather than adding amendment to the current ordinance. Um, just because we'd have to revise 13.10.140. Thank you. Further, further discussion, Council Member Bradbury. Just point of clarification. So, are you, for the manager, are you wanting me to pull my amendment? No, ma'am. I'm just saying if, if the if the council does pass it, if you could make the direction to edit 13.10.140. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was on the same page. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Um, further discussion on the amendment. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Matani? Yes. Gage? No. Bradbury? Yes. Kistler? No. Flora? No. Finnegan? No. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. That amendment fails four three to four, mm -hmm. I guess. Four to three, that brings us back to the original. Council Member Kissler. Well, I would like to add the recommended amendment as advised. Um, I move to amend section two of ordinance number 23.1974 to add and April 1st, 2025, following effective April 1, 2024. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on that amendment. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Then again. Yes. Gage? Yes. Kissler? Yes. Bradbury? Yes. Matani? No. Flora? Yes. 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 Okay. That amendment passes. Now we're back to. <laughs> <laughs> the main remember, motion. remember a while back, guys? We're back, we're, we're back to the main motion. Is there any other discussion on the main motion? Okay. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Bradbury? No. <clears throat> Matani? No. Flora? Yes. Gas? Yes. Finnegan? Yes. Gage? Yes. Kissler? Yes. Okay. That passes five to two. Moving on to 6B, ordinance number 23, 1974, amending Ketchikan Municipal Code section 520015 entitled Limits and Prohibitions of Marijuana Establishments. Second reading, the chair will entertain a motion. Your Honor. Yes. Ordin I move the City Council to approve ordinance number 23, 1974, and second reading amending section 5.20. Point zero one five of the Ketchikan Municipal Code entitled Limits and Prohibition of Marijuana Establishments and Establish an Effective Date. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion, please. Mr. Gass. Uh, I have to say I have had some uh, pretty fruitful discussions since over the last couple of weeks on this topic. I was pretty uh, strongly in favor of it for basically the reasons of the free market and uh, opening up industry to potential entrepreneurs, as I think that's important. Um, but I do have to say, I, I, some people who disagreed with me raised some points that I hadn't really fully considered on this topic. A um, couple of them being one, this is kind of different than on other things like with the taxi where we increased the permits because someone came and requested it and provided a reason why no one's really uh no one's really requested uh that we allow more stores here um and secondly the other major topic that we're all uh dealing with and trying to brainstorm and help solve is the issue with homelessness uh, and problems downtown, and I think we can all agree that uh, alcohol and drug use and also marijuana use, whether you want to call that a drug or not, is um, doesn't help that situation. And uh, we've got a pretty major crisis in our town with quality of life in certain areas uh, stemming from those problems. So um, I think I'm going to, I'll just say honestly, I've changed my mind on this and I'm uh, no longer in favor of it because I think those concerns outweigh my uh, statements from the last meeting on potentially opening up for someone else to open another pot store. I think we have plenty of pot, drugs, and alcohol in town. Right now, so, going to do a 180. Okay, Mr. Matani. Uh, well, I agree with all the comments uh, Councilmember Gass made. I am strongly for free enterprise, but in this case, I changed my mind because safety, health, and we have a huge, huge issue with homelessness. And there will be at the next meeting people that will come and talk about petty crimes and people being high, stealing from stores and other areas. And also, through the chair, I'd like to ask the manager or the assistant manager a question. 
has there ever been a health study of the impact of marijuana or safety study, but how do we patrol it with DUI? Has there ever been a study? Uh, Your Honor, uh, Councilmember Maswani, to the best of my knowledge, there has not been a study um, relative to field sobriety testing. I would defer to the Deputy Police Chief um, on what their tactics are to ascertain if someone is under the influence. Um, that's sort of your question. <clears throat> so if I understand the question, it's if and how we can enforce DUI via marijuana or other drugs. Mm -hmm. So we currently are trained for the uh, detection of both alcohol and narcotics. We have some officers that are basic field sobriety test trained, and we have others that are, it's called A-RIDE, which is Advanced Roadside Impairment Detection Enforcement. So we have most of the department that's also trained in A-RIDE, which isn't specifically on just marijuana, but all narcotics. So the process with that is a little bit different though. Uh, person that's suspected under the influence of either alcohol, and in this case, specifically drugs, they're gonna go through the same process as far as the field sobriety test. Uh, they'll still be provided to, or they'll still be expected uh, under law to provide a breast sample. And at that point, then we seek a search warrant for blood samples. And then it goes to the process of the court from there. So there is no actual arrest in a DUI narcotics case until the blood results get back, which is a bit of a delay. Thank you. Yeah. Through the chair, I'd like to make an amendment to postpone this indefinitely. Seeing no second. I'll second it. There's no discussion on that, correct? It's just a vote. It's just a vote. Okay, so the amendment is to defer indefinitely. Please call the roll. Can I get point of clarification before we vote? Sure. Um, so postponing this indefinitely would just take us right back to where we were of two facilities or two stores in town. Is that the correct? Uh, Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other clarifying questions? Okay, please call the roll. Finnegan. Yes. 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 Majani? Yes. Gage? Yes. Bradbury? Yes. Kissler? Yes. Flora? No. Okay, that passes. So it's indefinitely delayed and we'll move on on to item 7a new business ordinance number 23 1975 authorizing the execution and delivery of a schedule to the existing master equipment lease purchase agreement for the acquisition financing and leasing of firefighting equipment and work truck with plow authorizing execution and delivery of the other documents required in connection therewith authorizing all other actions necessary to the consummation of the transactions contemplated by this ordinance, exempting the lease from the competitive bidding and certain other procurement requirements first reading. The chair will entertain a motion. Your Honor. Yes. I move the City Council approve ordinance number 23-1975 in first reading, authorize the City to enter into a lease financing agreement for the acquisition of firefighting equipment and work truck with plow exempting the financing lease from competitive bidding and other procurement requirements, providing for the filing of referendum petitions and establishing an effective date. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion. Mr. Gauss. Um, this is a little bit of a touchy subject because nobody ever wants to be the person to question anything to do with safety, fire department, police. Um, but I guess I would just state that I do have a little bit of a concern with the spending that seems to be going on. Um, and I guess I don't need to say too much, but I have a concern with it and I feel it's uh, a little bit robust in a lot of different areas. And we also have concern taking money out of the public work sales tax fund because we all know 
what's the main complaint we always hear, the roads and other things. And so uh, I guess I would just make that comment that I'm a little concerned with some of the spending. Other discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Natani? Yes. Laura? Yes. Yes? No. Finnegan? Yes. Gage? Yes. Kissler? Yes. Bradbury? Yes. Or no, sorry. No. Okay. That motion passes five to two. Hmm. Mo moving hmm. on to item 7B, resolution number 23. 2888 regarding the city's intention to issue tax exempt obligations to Chairwoman or Tanner Nelson. Your Honor. Yes. I move the City Council approve resolution, resolution number 232888 regarding the city's intention to issue tax exempt obligations and establish an effective date. Second. It's been moved in second discussion. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Bradbury? Yes. Laura? Yes. Madani? Yes. Gisler? Yes. Finnegan? Yes. Bass? Yes. And Gage? Yes. That motion passes seven to eleven. Item 7C, permit for use of city property, Rainbird Trail parking lot between the city of Ketchikan and the Alaska Department of Administration. The chair will entertain a motion. Your Honor, I move the city council approve the permit for you. The use of city property between the city of Ketchikan and ADOA and authorize the city manager to execute the agreement on behalf of the city council. Second. second. Moving second to discussion. Yes. Um, for clarification purposes, um, since the assistant city manager is in the room, I'll defer to her. Uh, uh, this agreement basically states they could set it out Thursday morning for testing and it needs to be removed Thursday night. Is that the correct existing agreement? Your Honor, that had been the existing verbal agreement. Um, our understanding from council is that you would like essentially to give the state unlimited access to the lot while they are utilizing it so that cones are remaining up so that the concern that the community can use that area for driving practice would, would be in place. And I'm gonna to defer to the manager because she is the one that worked with the attorney if she's, if she's able to speak to clarify that that is also her understanding relative to this agreement. Thank you, Lacey, um, that's correct. Okay. So we, we wouldn't be telling them to take it up and down or anything like that. They're giving the permit will give them full use of that lot for that purpose. And then follow up. I know public works is not here to ask this question, but I was wondering if it would be uh, better to move it a little ways down the parking lot so that um, it wasn't near the trailhead parking where most people are using that parking lot for trailhead. I did speak with um, the DMV about that and they were like, yeah, we don't, it doesn't matter if it's on one end or the other. And I don't know if it matters to public works. Uh, the two complaints I, I didn't, I just got a general summary of what they were, not actually defining what they were. So I just didn't know if if we need to designate that in here or they could talk with public works to determine where to place it or. Um, Mr. Chair, Councillor Bradbury, absolutely. That's a com because we don't specify where the cones are. It's just use of the lot. We can absolutely just sit with DMV and come up with the best solution. And, and I'll ask Mark to do that Perfect. on Friday. Other discussion? I would like to put uh, or put an amendment in there that allowed for the use of the back Ted Ferry Center parking lot for um, parallel parking testing when there is construction in that parking lot. It's recommended for second. the team. Moved in second. Any discussion? Just to... For, for, to put out there what the reasoning behind that was is in my conversation with DMV, there have been times that there 
the city is needing to do paint the lines or do some repairs of that area, dig out the ditch because it's you know full and flooding over. And sometimes that work does coincide with Thursday's testing day. And so if that does happen, they do have to cancel all testing for that day because that is the only current designated location on city property that they can parallel park for testing. And so um, they just wanted to have a backup place. Um, so if the city does need to do any work, they could still do testing, um, parallel parking testing in a separate location temporarily so it doesn't hinder those businesses or that business. Um, and also I did ask why we couldn't move it there permanently. And they said in the winter, um, they aren't allowed mm -hmm. to go up certain grades of hills, which I, I learned this. And so that's why Ted Ferry would not be able to be used necessarily in the winter time for testing. So, um, I just wanted to put that in there. So we did have a backup as we all know, there is a huge backup in testing and I would hate to be the hindrance of it. So just throwing it in there. Might never be used. But. Council Member Kistler. Um, I'm wondering if that would obligate us, obligate us, because uh, if there's an event going on there, then that could be a problem. So I don't know. And I think Delilah had her hand up. Manager Walsh. I just wanted to ask a clarification on the use of the parking lot. I know our, and I could be wrong, but I believe our use of the Ted Ferry lot is not exclusive because we share it. <clears throat> with another business and I just I, I'd like the opportunity to follow up on that I'll pull my amendment your honor I'll pull my second amendment. okay don't want to create more work okay. I just want to make sure that any other best. okay any other discussion on this item seeing none please call the roll Laura yes Matami yes this one yes then again yes 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 Gage. Yes. Bradbury? Yes. Okay. Motion passes seven no. Item seven D review of library collection development policy. The chair will entertain a motion. Your Honor, I move to review the library collection policy, consider any library advisory board recommendations, and direct staff to make any changes conveyed and approved by the city council. Second. Moved and seconded. I am going to offer an amendment. I move to defer review of the library collection policy until after the library advisory board meeting of October 2023. Second. And we'll have a discussion, I'm sure. I'll provide my initial rationale. <clears throat> Pardon me for just a moment. So the original motion says, and I quote, consider any library advisory board recommendations. Well, that hasn't happened yet. So if we're going to actually honor the work of the library board and public input, this body making decisions before the library board weighs in is backwards and discounts any input we might get. So I would like to see it delayed until October. Mr. Gass. Uh, I was able to listen to the entire meeting, the most recent library advisory board meeting. And if I, my memory serves me correctly, it, I normally, I somewhat agree with what you're saying, but the concern I have is, uh, I believe this was the third meeting, if I heard correctly, where library advisory board meeting, which only happens every three months, where this topic was on the agenda and brought up and it's essentially been lack of a better term, kicked down the road. And again, after some discussion and I would call pre-review, uh, it was deemed that the review would no longer continue and would be postponed in our three months. So that's the only thing that has me uh, a little concerned on that is it seems like, I mean, it seems like it's kind of been going on for quite some time. Mr. Finnegan. So having been in attendance at that library advisory board meeting and having been on the on that board since uh, the end of 2022, it's the first time it's been a topic of discussion on the library advisory board since I've been there. And the proposed uh, tabling that discussion until the next quarterly meeting of October was amended to include the proposed changes to the policy be forwarded to the 
library director for dissemination to the library advisory board. So there were specific points of discussion of changes that were proposed that could be discussed by the board at that next meeting. So I operate on the assumption that we will have actual motions to discuss and consider or changes to discuss to the policy at that next meeting. Yeah. Ms. Gage. I uh, also attended that meeting and listened and there was nothing brought to the board for them to discuss. And so the, I thought the board did a great uh, service to the community and the board by recommending that um, in October, they bring um, those who have actual changes that they want to the um, policy be brought to them and given given to them the month before the meeting so that they can review it so there could be a discussion. Because what was happening was it was line by line, just reading it and no no given um, what they wanted, what somebody wanted to change. So in order for anybody on that board to be able to do their job, they needed to know what the person wanted changed on the agenda or on the policy, excuse me. Um, so I think I think we shouldn't be we shouldn't be going over and um, overriding the advisory board um, and allowing them to do their job. And you know, um, yeah, they get their um, I what they want changed on their policy in by um, September so that everyone on the board has time to read through it and then discuss it on the October meeting. Okay. Councilmember Bradbury. Yeah, I uh, obviously I made their original future agenda item, um, knowing that the library advisory board had it on their agenda to discuss uh, or to review <clears throat> and just to discuss their opinions on it. Um, I did also listen to that meeting and um, they opted not to review it, knowing that this was coming up. That is absolutely their choice. Uh, we also heard a majority of them pretty much saying that they're not going to change it even in October. Um, but as we have done with other policies and topics that do also have an advisory board, we don't always wait for the advisory board. Sometimes they review it after we review it and pass um, the one thing I would, or one similar thing is Ports and Harbors Advisory Board. Um, we didn't talk about rate changes with them. That's their Ports and Harbors Advisory Board. Probably should have done that and weighed in for that, but we didn't wait for that. Um, Doc Bender Program, again, Ports and Harbors Advisory Board probably should have weighed in on that because that's their realm. We didn't wait for them. So um, I specifically put this future agenda item after they were having a meeting knowing that it was already on the agenda, they opted to defer it. So with that, I'm taking their consideration as they don't have any changes and they think the policy is fine, uh, which is what was heard by a majority of them even without a vote. Um, so yes, I would have loved to have recommendations, but again, we sit here and talk about things all the time without going to the advisory boards that have a little bit more information. So um, I would like to continue uh, going forward with this um, and, yeah, that's it. Okay, you make a couple of good points. Yes, that does happen on occasion. Sometimes it's just the timing of how agendas, either for the, any advisory board or the city council times out. Um, the fact that they didn't take it up was not in our purview. So really, I, I suppose the question, my question to the council is, regardless of whether they spoke to it or not, does this body feel that the library board and library staff should have the opportunity to weigh in on a topic that has been, as Mr. Gass pointed out, very much a hot button divisive topic. If we allow the library board, the public and staff to weigh in, I believe we are more inclined to reach something that resembles a compromise than not. So that's what I think, Mr. Gass. Um, somewhat to follow up with what Councilmember Bradbury said, uh, I agree. I mean, uh, it's been on their agenda multiple times. They had the opportunity to to do a full review, as was stated earlier. A, a 
the pre-review was started and then the, the super majority of the board voted to again postpone it. So I think they've had more than a window. This item was, as every item that gets on our agenda, was posted publicly with the time frame. Uh, members of the public, staff of the library, any other person had an opportunity to see that uh, it was on the agenda. We did hear from some folks who had opinions on it. So I think as far as giving time to hear from the public and any other person who may or may not be staff, I think that's been more than done. Um, I think it's it's been overly done actually. So I, th I think it's appropriate to move forward. Mr. Finger. Uh, just two thoughts. At first, I'm hesitant to assume that the library advisor, advisory board wouldn't consider any changes to the policy. If that were the case, if that had been the attitude of the board, then I think a vote would have been held to preserve the policy in its entirety. I think tabling the agenda item until October offers the opportunity to discuss prospective changes to the policy. Second, I think if the city council elects itself as the body solely responsible for review of that policy, we discount those members of the community who are borough residents, but not city residents, who don't have representation at this table the way that they do at the library advisory board table. There are uh, at large board members who are borough residents and not city residents, and having them at that discussion allows residents of the borough who are not residents of the city to weigh in on those discussions. I also, I, yeah, um, I don't, I don't think it's our job to be doing this, period. We don't do it with every other department. And we're going down a slippery slope where we're going to be like censoring our library because of a few people that don't like the vote. You make a vote. Everyone at this table doesn't always agree with the vote on items. But you have to live with it and you have to agree with it. You don't have to like it, but the majority of the vote is how it plays. Censoring our library because somebody doesn't agree. I you know there are 1600 items in the library that are of uh, religious um, objects or the Bible. All the items are there. Everything. You choose. Everyone in this room and everyone in this community has the right to choose what they choose to read. It is not the city council's job to dictate to the library what their job is. We hired them to do their job. We have bigger fish, bigger issues in this community than that library and what's in it. Council Member Kistler. Um, yeah, I think we should give the library a chance to uh, do their job, to um, review things, and um, they postponed it. They intend to look at it. If people have specific things, I had a specific book that I didn't want my grandkids to happen upon. That was a specific thing. I, I'm not into micromanaging the library, and I think they need to go through their process. So. I got a comment. I'm going to remind this body that a couple of meetings ago, we split a question in regards to appeals process. And we set ourselves up as the last stop for appeals to come. And now tonight, while yes, there's been some delays, but you know what? Government is slow and stodgy and not very efficient a lot of times, including advisory boards. But where we decided that the proper application of the civic process was to be the last stop on the appeals process. Now, tonight, we're the first stop. We just trump everybody else. And you know what? They're not going to weigh in if we weigh in tonight and we make decisions. That's pretty heavy handed in my, in my view. So I think maybe the best thing we can do is let these folks do their work. There's no substantial harm that I can foresee waiting a couple of months for this to come back to us, if it really needs to come back to us at all, and take it from there. Mr. Guess. 
I just want to say with all due respect, I strongly disagree with your first comment because as I stated, it's been on their agenda multiple times. It was listed, there was posted, people could talk to us. Uh, but the other point I wanted to make is something that hasn't been brought up yet. And this is a concern of mine and a concern of, frankly, a lot of people who disagreed with me on our last library related decision. Their point was, as Ms. Gage said, it's a slippery slope. If what's gonna stop us from, you know, we're gonna go down this path of, well, people could just, we're gonna have all these books and everybody's gonna spend all their time reviewing 4,000 books. I, I don't know if it's appropriate to say, but I had one simple one sentence amendment that I wanted to put in place that I think would prevent that slippery slope because we didn't ban any books. We didn't throw any books out of the library. We simply wanted to take sexually explicit material out of the children's section. I think an amendment to do something like that would put it in writing going forward uh, that clearly says books of sexually explicit content shall not be in the youth section, for example, or something of that nature. And that way, going forward, it would prevent a lot of this uh, gray area where one person's opinion versus another, it would just be uh, set in stone. So I think by making some some reasonable, simple uh, reviews or, or changes or adjustments or additions to the policy, we could prevent some of the slippery slope that is a fair concern. Council member Bradbury, and then please, if, if we're gonna to speak to this anymore, um, could we please try to limit reiterations and have new information come up on this? Cause we're, I'm gonna call for a vote here pretty quick. Go ahead. I'll defer to uh, Kessler for her to call first. Um, yes, I think that, uh, what Mr. Gass brings up is a specific thing that you could take to the library and say, can we please add that? And I, I think that should be done at that next meeting. Councilman Bender. Yeah, so through this whole process of this different events that have come up and, and uh, books that have come up, um, I hear quite a bit, well, this, this isn't the council's job to look at our policies um, that it's the library advisory boards or the library director's board, our library director's job, um, and that we don't do this with any other department. And I, I find that hard to believe because we sit here and we discuss policies and procedures even for every single department within the city. We, we dictate to ports and harbors without their uh, input on how they're going to conduct their business in the ports and harbors. We do that with KPU as well. We, we have all of these policies that we do look at, we do review. Um, this one even says we need to be reviewing or it should be reviewed annually. Um, so I guess you know, the term policy is where, I guess maybe I'm confused as a council member, but I'm pretty sure that is what we are sitting here to do is to look through these policies to make sure these policies are up to date. Um, I know for me and the changes I wanted to make to the collection policy are actually changes the that the ALA says you should have in a collection policy that we don't even have. And that is there to protect our library. Um, so it's it's things like that. I'm kind of I guess I don't understand why we can't review a policy to make sure it's current um, to the guidance of the ALA, why these recommendations weren't given to us prior to this meeting by staff is, I, again, I don't, I don't understand. The ALA gives tons of guidance on how to do a collection of uh, uh, development policy that incorporates all of these different topics that we all have expressed uh, passion for. And um, as I've heard multiple times again, you know, they are the, the people that we follow. I mean, it's stated in our collection policy that um, the ALA is, you know, a significant part of where we get our information from. Um, so I guess I just, I'm, I'm frustrated because we do have policy in front of us. We sit here and say, we're, we're going to talk about policies it's our duties to review a policy and determine is this policy fit for our community or not. It doesn't matter if it is KPU, if it's telecommunications, um, if it is sewer or water 
Um, it doesn't matter what department it's for as we sit here and um, create policies for other departments um, just tonight. Uh, why, why is this any different? Um, I, I am concerned if not kind of order, dealing with their policy. Are we speaking to the timing now, not the actual policy? Yes, we're speaking to the timing. Okay, so I'm just saying um, it is deferred saying that we shouldn't be talking about the policy, but that's our job here is to talk about the policy. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm concerned on why we're deferring what we say we should be doing. Mr. Finnegan, and then we're going to vote. Uh, uh, I think I should vote. I was just going to, if we're talking about the timing, then okay. I don't want to get into a policy matter. All right. So the amendment on the floor is to defer review of the collection policy until after the October 2023 meeting of the Library Advisory Board. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Matani? No. Gage? Yes. Bradbury? No. Kistler? Yes. Flora? Yes. Finnegan? Yes. Gas? No. Motion passes four to three. That'll take us to approval of vouchers. What so the motion oh. will be on the floor from tonight um, that was made by Bradbury and Gas. So when we meet again, that motion will still be on the table. The original motion. Yes. Yeah. And second meeting of October. Well, when they after they have when after they have their October meeting, but um, we're also moving the library board meeting to the chambers, and we are going to be recording it on TV. So that's a new thing that we kind of put into place. Good, because that was terrible. Yeah. So when we're in here, we're going to have somebody uh, be able to work the WebEx that evening, and so from here on out, they'll be here and. Okay, approval of vouchers. Payment of vouchers, Parnassus Books, $73.94. Your Honor. Yes. I move for the approval of vouchers to Parnassus Books in the amount of $73.94. Second. Move to the second. Did anybody want to talk about that? Don't I'm get into things. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, call the roll, please. Just. Gas. No. Gage. Yes. Bradbury. Yes. Flora? Yes. Matani? Yes. Kistler? Yes. Finnegan? Yes. Pass the six to one. Manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> on my report, I have the a list of employees. We just want to give kudos to Danny Marcano. And um, she actually went above and beyond to defray the any injuries in our go-kart situation on the 4th of July. Also to Amanda Robinson and the engineering group at PW. They did quite a bit of work at Ted Ferry when we were updating our library, our, our lighting system. And then um, I'd actually like to defer to Jeremy. I don't have the names, but we had several employees who pulled a full 24 hour shift at the Herring Cove upgrade um, in order to get that system rebuilt and back up. And Jeremy, I don't know if you're online, if you could give a comment on those employees. Yes, ma'am, I am online. So I'd like to say a big thank you to um, big thank you to our line crew, all of our line crew <laughs> present for that work. We had a uh, outing at um, Herring Cove for the ADOT contract that's going on out there with the bridge. And we uh, had our system split where our generation on the south end was off. And we developed some um, problems during that 12 hour uh, outage that ended up being about a 23 and a half hour outage. Now, at the end of the day, our customers didn't really uh, see an impact from this, but our generation was offline. So um, I'd like to thank uh, all of our line crew, that'd be Nick Kufner, uh, Donald Monhoven, um, our apprentice, uh, Mr. Orta, um, Jay Simmer, I'm gonna forget somebody here, and I apologize if I do. Jeff. Uh, yep, Jeff. <laughs> And um, and then we also had our electricians involved with that, and that would be um, Gabe Connolly and Dennis Moody and um, Steve Osborne, uh, Kip Cook, uh, 
those guys were all involved with that and um, some mechanics. We had uh, Kelly Davis, uh, Jim Hendricks, and um, we also had um, Colin uh, involved with that. So I just wanted to say Colin Ayers. So so I want to say thank you to all of those guys for just being entrenched and making sure that our community is taken care of when it comes to our utility power. And uh, they went above and beyond. So big thank you to them. Thank you. Anything else, Ms. Walsh, or you want to rest your voice a little bit? I, yeah, I won't speak too much, but I'll answer any questions. <laughs> Ms. Bradbury. It's my regular meeting question about tourism manager position. I know we were in background. Just wondering what the status of that is. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, council member. We have completed the background check. My goal was to actually talk to the candidate today. Um, but I didn't make it to that far. So I'm hoping we can have um, a final offer and everything settled and accepted by the end of this week. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Council committee reports. We had several that are on the table. If anybody wants to speak to either their own report or if any council members have questions of another member's report, now's your chance. Going, going, gone. Okay. City clerk's file. Um, I couldn't find my report I had written, but um, I just want to inform everyone our candidacy period begins August 1st. So that'll be, you know, it'll already be going after our next meeting of August 3rd. The deadline to file is August 25th, which is actually a Friday, I think, at 5 o'clock. Um, you have the whole entire month to Get your applications in. The applications can be found in the clerk's office, can be found online, and then they'll need to be submitted to the clerk's office, City Hall, fourth floor, by 5 o'clock on August 25th. Um, The other thing we've also posted is an application for election workers. If anybody's interested in serving on election day, we're actually doing applications this year, and we're doing a couple... We do a training, but we're doing some um, extra chair training and um, putting everything together because um, October 3rd is coming up fast. <laughs> so we're, we're, that's pretty much all I had to say. It was more okay. about election stuff. So we'll keep you posted as time goes on. Okay, thank you. Council member Bradbury. I just have a question for the clerk. You had mentioned earlier about the library advisory board meeting uh-huh. being in here now. Um, is that something that you guys are imposing for all of our advisory boards so that we can well, Port start Harbor's paying? already meets here, but, but it's not recorded. No, it's not recorded, and they would have to have a staff person. And we and uh, the library director indicated she had a person that could run the WebEx. Those so if they find somebody that can help, you know, operate the WebEx with KPU, they could be televised as well. It'll just take a but everything's on. Um, We'll be at, you know online. We're putting everything on Facebook, you know, for the meeting advertisements and everything. So, yeah, um, if they want, they can contact us, and we certainly could make that happen. Is that a policy? A follow up, sorry, Yara. <laughs> is that a policy that we can make for our advisory boards? And the only reason I say that is um, the other municipalities on our island in Southeast Alaska, all their advisory board meetings are recorded and. Uh, posted just as if it was a council meeting and I'm wondering if that is something we could start doing so that the public who maybe has to work like for instance I have a meeting at noon I barely can make it I don't know how the general public can make it but it would be nice you know for them to be able to to watch and to listen um, when they can if and they can. what we could do also is um, we could just record it on WebEx and post it the next day. So we don't have to have, and like we're recording tonight, we had a little sound technical issue tonight, and but we did record that all on WebEx and it's so easy, we just post it in the morning, that way people can watch it. And under our title, under uh, council agenda, it also says committees now. Um, and I also created a hot button on the uh, our website for committee applications. So you don't have to go dig for the application if you want to apply for one of our advisory boards. Okay. There's actually a hot button now where you can just click on it. It takes you right there to the... I had someone call and they had a little difficulty finding it, so we created a hot button to make it easier 
for people that wanted to apply for our um, advisory board. So. Okay, so we don't need to go through a policy to say that they're all going to be recorded moving no, forward? No, uh, would just be done with the clerk's department or? We can just do it. We can, we can do it. I can talk to the manager and see how she would want to do that because the the library, the Port and Harbors, they are codified. Mm -hmm. they're, co they're in the museum. And the museum, they, I think they only meet quarterly too, don't they? Yes, it's quarterly. And they have, That's correct. I have not talked to Anita or the museum director mm -hmm. about holding her meetings here. I'm just yeah, I, I just, she hasn't approached us, but because there were some comments from the last library board about not being able to view it. And because of the space availability, we um, decided, or the library director decided it would probably be better. Yeah, but if, I'll talk to manager Walsh and see if that's something that she wants to put in somewhere in front of policies goes. Yeah, just curious. Okay. Anybody okay. else? Okay. City attorney's report, but I believe he was smart enough and left town. Yeah, uh, so we'll pass on that future agenda item. Your Honor. Yes. Um, I'd like to put, um, um, request an agenda item to add three day requirement to the rules of procedure for council to be followed by both council and staff requiring staff and council members to submit all documents on any given agenda item for council consideration that are lengthy. Um, prior to the meeting to the rules of procedure for council. Okay. Any others? Okay. Then mayor and council comments. Mr. McConnell. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to everybody here. I think sitting here today, we've shown unity. We've shown compromise. We've shown that we can all get along and be civil about it and be united about it. I think this will portray and bring forward as leaders to the community as well. So thank you, everybody. Ms. Brother. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, good discussions are had. I appreciate everyone's opinion in both sides. I appreciate the folks in the community that uh, did reach out to me with opposing views and were willing to sit down and and to talk through those civilly, I really appreciate that because uh, some things did uh, help me kind of move forward in making decisions tonight. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm not one to, or I am one that will admit if I uh, am wrong and will, you know, sit here and cast, cast a different vote. So I appreciate all of that. I also want to give a huge shout out again. I feel like this has now become a reoccurring thing. The fire department, they again right there when we needed them saving saving our backs so i really appreciate uh, the professionalism especially in my work scenario um they were very delicate with the situation and, and helped alleviate any anxieties of our customers so i really appreciate that thank you ms kistler uh i oh, i'd um I would like to say I really like the idea in the manager's report about the extra handicap parking for the 4th of July. That's uh, that's way more than a compromise. They're adding parking for handicaps. And, and I know that's one big thing about the 4th of July. It is a, a big trek a lot of times to have to, to try and get to the parade unless you get there very early. And uh, it's another reason why I keep my motorcycles, I'll tell you what, because you can park those suckers anywhere um, and uh, uh, give people, I've given people the rides back to their car before. Um, so I think that's a, a cool thing. Thank you. And oh my goodness, the guys, the electricians, 24 hours, my goodness, good job. Mr. Finnegan. Yeah, I would like to echo uh, Ms. Kistler's uh, salutations toward and Mr. Bynum and Ms. Walsh's um, commendations for those members of the city staff who went above and beyond one of those uh, one of those lengthy hours and difficult circumstances. My my thanks to them. I also like the the notion of the library advisory board meeting happening in these chambers, plus the addition of any other boards that are able to convene the space. I think granting the public more access to those discussions is good for the health of the community. And last, I want to uh, thank Council Member Gass for his comments as Citizen Gass uh, toward the, um, the need for us to remember each other and uh, to do what we can to avoid assuming the worst about each other, which I think 
is not necessarily unique to Ketchikan. I think it's a big part of what's infected the national discourse overall. I think it's unfortunate, and I think it doesn't serve the overall betterment and health of our community. So I want to thank him for speaking to that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gage. Yeah, um, I want to thank staff for everything they've been doing. Um, I also will, um, I really appreciate the extra disabled parking for people with disabilities, not handicapped, because the wording has been changed over the course of 10 years. I don't consider myself handicapped. I consider myself that they're able. But that said, it's disabled and it's disabled parking. But um, I also would like to acknowledge the fact that I think it's very important. I think um, Council Member Ga uh, Gas brings up a good point about being understanding of other people and differences. However, we also have to remember that that doesn't mean that the other, the minority, the individual who is different from the other or the majority or the minority has to compromise for to be non-divisive. We have to remember that divisiveness is what makes this country work. It's what democracy is. Having discussions about issues that are uncomfortable, be it race, disabilities, um, LGBTQ, or color are important. Materials in our library are important so that people can learn about those things. Books like The Hate You Give gives you a good indication and an understanding of other people if you've read it. There are books on the chopping block because they make white white people uncomfortable. For me, it makes me think about what other people are going through. Like I said before, many, you know, 28 years ago, I was not disabled. So I didn't know what it was like to be disabled. I do now. I also understand that, you know, ADA hasn't been in effect except for 30 years. 30 years ago, no one had um, rights as a disabled individual. We didn't have parking. We still have issues with parking. I can get into the parking lot up at the Ted Ferry where they put in a hand, um, motorcycle spot right next to the disabled parking and it, it impedes on the wheelchair access. I understand they put that spot there. However, you know how many cars I've seen parked there? No motorcycles, but cars. And they impede on the wheelchair access to that lot. I used it the other yesterday when I went to the recidivism meeting on um, people coming out of jail. Good news is on the recidivism meeting was that um, the jails are now implementing a process where people get their ID before they leave jail. So if they didn't have an ID or it was overdue, they're doing them in the jail. It's, it did start and it is here, which will make it a lot easier for people to um, get jobs and whatnot because that was a huge barrier. Um, so, and, and that's my news brief. So. Okay, Councilman Rodas. Uh, firstly, I'd like to express my appreciation for the, uh, actually this go around with several members of the public who disagreed with me on an issue in particular that I had voted on and uh, reached out to me anyway to, uh, express their concerns and kind of change my point of view. So I appreciate folks who are willing to approach people who may not have the same uh, same opinions. And sometimes we may change each other's opinions, although it would be probably pretty rare, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. And I uh, also want to uh, express my thanks to the many members who reached out to me and I'm sure everyone else on, uh, on the library issue. Again, heard from both sides. One comment I have heard uh, a few times lately on some of these issues is it's a it's good for us, myself included, all people, to try to reach beyond your normal day-to-day -day social circles. Uh, you know, you may be in a group of friends, your family. Odds are you're going to be speaking to people who have similar views of, with you all the time, myself definitely included. It's always good to reach out and, and at least consider 
those who do not. So I appreciate uh, that people are starting to do that more often. And uh, yeah, it's a good thing. That's all I got. Okay. 840. Look at us. Didn't we do a good job? Okay. And with that, move to adjourn. Thank you.